Thanks for the invitation. And uh, first I'd like to acknowledge my co-author, Danny Lee, who's sitting back here in row one, two, three, four, five. And I've been working with Danny since 1995, no, since 2002. I began my research career with the Forest Service in fire about 1995. That was a few years after something uh, in Northern California known as the Great 87 Firestorm. All of a sudden, after decades and decades of no fire, all these fires started from a lightning storm. And then as the years progressed, there were more and more fires, and now fires, large fires, mega fires, are so frequent there that in some places of the Trinity Alps, we've restored the fire interval to what it was before in centuries past, despite our best efforts to not let that happen. And so, now living in the Southern Alps, in an area that burned with equal frequency, when all of a sudden we start to have a huge fire season as we did in the fall of 2016, I get nervous because I remember that great change, that transition that I to some degree lived through. So I'd like to provide a regional overview now of uh, not just the Gatlinburg fire, but all the other events of the region that surrounded that. And it was a huge fire season, long before Gatlinburg happened. I want to summarize this regional event, and then connect the dots to make sense of uh, the various things that happened as much as we can thus far, and then move more toward a sense of risk to understand how that learning might help us move forward. And all these dots on here are fires from the fall of 2016 across the southern Alps. This, oops, go back, go back. This right here is the Gatlinburg fire. They're more or less area size to the fire. Here's a really big one in the Catahoochee uh, in northern Georgia, 27,000 acres, the biggest fire that we've seen of record. A lot of big fires, a dozen large fires. That happened, most happened long before Gatlinburg. And this is what it looks like from a more normal looking map. This is land cover, so the green is net forest, this is agriculture here. So this is the Southern Alps here. It really intersects four states. I'm excluding Virginia in my perspective. Uh, Gatlinburg's about here. The red and the pink are urban areas. So Great Smokies this year. A lot of this is national forest. There's national forests in all, uh, in three of these states, or actually two, South Carolina. And these large fires were everywhere. I like to think of the fall fire season as a completely different beast than the spring fire season and the summer fire season for a number of reasons. One of those reasons uh, you see here on this graph, this is area burned in acres. This is a stack bar graph. And you can see week by week what the distribution of fire is by cause. So the black are accidental fires, mostly in the spring, mostly in the fall. Uh, arson fire is a huge fraction of the fires in the spring, even more in the fall. Uh, there's always the unknown to mix in. They're probably also human. And then the lightning fires in the summer, mostly, until you get to these over here, which actually just happened in the fall of 2016. If you add it all up, you can see it's mostly a human fire regime. That's what characterizes uh, this area. It's pretty much uh, uh, the case with small fires, too, when you look at them. In the more remote areas, not so much in the downtown areas that the local fire departments have to deal with. That tends to be a little more complicated. But this is the predominant fire season in the spring and the fall when you add everything up. These are radically different seasons, though. Every, if you go back, now records, fire records are horrible. You want to have a good long-term context, but if you take this, just uh, the federal data, so this is Great Smokies and the National Forest, where we have a pretty good sense of a consistent fire record back to 1970, and you turn all the spring fires into a pie and you carve up each year in terms of area, you see that pretty much every year we have some large fire acres burn, right? 2016 was the record largest 
in the spring, 8.4% of the total. On average, it's maybe two, two and a half percent if you divide it out evenly. The fall is completely different, especially since 2016 happened. There's just a few years where you have large fires. Three year in a row, 1999, 2000, 2001, 27, and then 2016. Look at that, of the fall, just taking the fall into context. In the last half century, half of the area that we burned in the fall, over that whole half century, burned in that six week period. People noticed. Uh, it was in the newspaper, everyone was breathing smoke for sometimes weeks on end across the region. Uh, for most of the fire season, it wasn't causing the sort of damage it eventually did, but still people noticed because uh, of the smoke they were breathing, uh, some evacuations occurred across the state, and it was a big part of the news. Paper. Statistics vary, for as far as I'm concerned, within this area, we're talking about 130,000 acres over those six weeks. Uh, we saw some weird fire behavior that people talk about, not just here, but even in Alabama and some of the surrounding states. Uh, long distance spotting, mass ember rings, long distance runs. And one of the most curious things, the things that really make me curious, where I want to go out there and do research on it, are these reburns where in the fall the litter is hanging up in the tree, the fuel is still up in the tree, fire burns in the litter and debris from the prior years, and, and the leaves fall, and the fire reburns. And sometimes that made a big difference on the size of the fire, uh, according to uh, people that were on the ground. And it made it hard. You had to constantly bring out your leaf blowers and blow the fire lines free to keep it from burning over. That's an amazing thing. Some of those leaves were also the embers that led to this long distance spotting and these ember rings that let fire burn in places you didn't think it could. Tens of thousands were evacuated, sometimes the encroaching fire, more often just this long duration of smoke exposure. <coughs> Fourteen died and hundreds were injured, mostly in Sevier County associated with Gatlinburg. 2,500 structures and six of those were actually in North Carolina before then. Insurance losses, one billion dollars in Sevier County. Taken together, all these large fires cost in suppression about 100 million, at least 84 million. Those numbers are hard to get, make sense of. Interestingly, and no one talks about this, but a good fraction of Greenville and South Carolina's water supply burned. And the fire was burned in places where we didn't think that it really would, or where it wasn't much of a risk in endangered species habitat, rich coves in places where there's really, really high southern Appalachian diversity. That surprised us because of how readily fire was able to move into those areas, most was because of ember rain. If we look at the season here, this is daily acres burned on the top, so up to 15,000 here, a little bit more, like 17,000 uh, at the end of the season. That's the Gatlinburg fire here. But look, a lot of this area, these acres had burned by the time we got to mid-November. Fire by fire, you can see how that cumulative acres adds up. Notice there's a phase here that some starts early and, and then it really starts to take off. Reaches a little bit of a break here and then there's a different phase where those fires, mostly in large wild areas, are just able to spread and spread as they will given management objectives and management constraints in some cases. These are wilderness areas. And then also part of this phase three, as I like to think about it, some of the arsonists who like to set these fires woke up and realized they could set even more fires. And so we had a lot start in the second period and those are the ones you see accumulating here. And then the big last phase occurring just in the course of a day or two was the fire that burned Gatlinburg in the surrounding area. Why? Biggest thing, drought. Extreme drought conditions. They let everybody know. This is what a typical mid-November day looked like. Can you can imagine breathing that for a while. You might say, well, drought. Okay, that makes sense. We all know drought and fire go together. Well, surprisingly enough, it's not so simple. 
in the eastern United States. Some of those ideas might be a little more western. This is the 2016 drought, and I apologize if you can't see these tiny little marks here. These are all the fires you saw them before, with the dots on that earlier map, associated with that 2016 drought. Here's North Carolina, so the most intense drought is northern Georgia. In past years, we also had some droughts, big drought in 2007 and then in 8. For those of you that are closer, you'll notice there's no fires, no large fires associated with those fall drought events. There's a few acres, but hardly any. And this is pretty darn severe in 2007. We had some fires here in 2001 when the drought was, fall drought was less severe. Biggest one in Great Smokies prior to the chimney tops too. Here the Sharp Fire on the North Carolina side burned in November of 2001. So drought certainly makes a difference, but it's not the only thing. So this was really curious to me. So I said, well, let's just look at this a little bit. Rather than use a drought index, I'm going to just compare moisture. So this is a measure of wetness, and I get that from stream flow. In the spring, it might be harder to do this, but in the fall, it works really well. I took 10 nice stream gauges across the whole southern apps that were not impounded by dams to give me a long, good record. And I averaged the October and November stream flow for these. So that's a measure of relative wetness in terms of average stream flow. And this is temperature. Temperature tends, anomalies tend to be a little more regional. So this is from a climate division data set from NOAA. So this is the average maximum temperature in degrees Fahrenheit. And every dot on here is a year since 1970. Where it fits in terms of its dryness and, and temperature. So you see in these three colors, three 15 year periods, the black is the last 15 years. And the colors are kind of scattered, so there's no obvious trend here in terms of getting more drought or less. But you can see the driest corner will be up here, the wettest corner will be down here. Here's some big years, 2016, look at that. Two full degrees warmer than these other droughts in 2001, 2007, here's 2008 from the prior map. Okay, well let's see how this maps out in terms of fire statistics on federal land. Well, the count, how many fires there are, that's big circles everywhere. So you can have a lot of starts when it's really dry or, you know, to some degree really wet. There seems to be a lot more over here, oh, a few more over here that are bigger. This area here tends to have fewer starts, but, you know, early on, especially when we were a little more careless with our emissions as a society, we had some big circles there. This is the real difference, no surprise. Area burned. Same <coughs> points, same years, same positions. This is 2016. Huge amount of area. We saw that before, right? Notice these prior years. Really big. <coughs> uh, this is 2001, the circle here. This is 2007. This is 2008 again. Notice these small area burns where it's wetter. So there's a climate driver here to be sure, but there's no guarantee, look at that, there's plenty of circles here. Drought is no guarantee of a large fire season or a large number of fires. A weird impact, this is totally amazing. When it's, when it's really uh, warm, when the fall is really warm, leaves tend to linger, they're greener in the tree for longer, and they fall later. However, when it's dry, <coughs> They can dry up earlier in the season and get down on the ground quicker. When it's hot and dry, you get this weirdness. And that's what we had. It was a hot, dry fall. And so the leaves were lingering. So when we get to the fires that were burning, as we saw in that cumulative graph over time, really early in the year, the litter was still up in the trees. So you go down there in winter and look, and wow, there's leaves everywhere that had fallen just a few <coughs> months earlier. You dig down under the leaves, and you find the charcoal. The leaves, the litter came onto the burned surface. But the fires that burn later, that's not so often true. There's much uh, less litter in those places. And that makes a difference in terms of fire behavior, in terms of fire spread, in terms of this ember rain and the capacity for it. <coughs> One of the biggest human costs of this, as I mentioned, was the smoke exposure. So here we have a smoky day in the middle of November. And if you look here, you see a little bit of black texture. Those black areas that you see swarming around here, those little 
areas are high elevation areas, so the fog set in in the valleys. This is Atlanta, this is Charlotte, cloud cover over eastern North Carolina, even uh, Raleigh Durham experienced a smoky day or two way over here. Nashville had plenty of smoke, as Henry will talk about. This was a really big, well, I guess he's over in Knoxville. Uh, this was a really big deal for a lot of people. Another aspect of this is it involves uh, these, and this, these are big fires, and this landscape is not just like the West. We don't have these massive wild areas. We have medium-sized wild ones surrounded by fragmented ownership. And here on this Boteller fire, you can see that pretty nicely. All these little black squares are parcels private parcels, and this is the fire perimeter. And you can see how many, just on this one fire, how many parcels were affected by that final fire line. A lot of these parcels don't have homes on them yet. They've been subdivided, but they're not built on yet. A lot of them have owners that are not local, and that's a phenomenon across the whole southeast, non-resident owners. This is a severity map here, and so you can see the high severity canopy areas. And uh, we'll see a couple of these. What I'm using are this new 10 meter uh, product from uh, Sentinel Satellite, European Satellite. It's pretty impressive. This is the consequences of fragmented ownership. When you have fire move through and you get a little bit of heat, people love to plant invasive invasives, and they don't always manage their invasives very well. Polonia, a princess tree, is a really pretty tree. It has big pink flowers in the spring. It's a horrible invasive. This is a little short one for what we found in late summer on this fire. It's about as, this tall already, and it's just you know eight months old. And there's thousands of them, and some of those are in private land. So it's not just the difficulty of managing the fire it's environment, it's managing the post-fire environment. That, affects the long-term viability of these landscapes. Uh, fascinating aspect of these, as I mentioned, is fires moving into these areas that we don't think would have burned that often. If you look at a land fire layer, you'll see that riparian areas had a lower fire frequency. Well, this area here burned in the 40s from an arsonist, and now it just burned again. This is one of the most biodiverse, richest parts of this landscape in the Nantale Gorge really cool species. There's a noonday snail here that's only known from this area. All of its habitat burned. Turns out it's okay, as are these trillions. But it's amazing to us to burn. Another fascinating observation is the places that are fire adapted, like this Table Mountain pine stand in Great Smokies, made exactly like it's supposed to. These are all Table Mountain pine seedlings. Now about that tall, they've established in the year after the fire. This was taken one year to the hour of when the fire passed through here, <clears throat> only because I had to find something to do when I couldn't, wasn't allowed to go to the uh, Association of Fire Ecology conference last fall. So I needed something to do. So I said, I know I'm going to make the best of it and do a saga through the Great Smokies, passing through the different parts of the fire just as the fire progressed over the course of that day, checking into my hotel the hour that the fire burned into the city. It was a surreal experience. But one of the most surreal experiences was seeing things that are totally predictable work out, just like you know they should. This is where the fire starts, and so it uh, leads to the conversation that uh, my colleagues are about to talk about. What can we learn from these fires about risk? That's a key question moving forward. It's great to be a historian, but we want to look forward. And one of the most unsettling things to me was thinking that my own home might be vulnerable. In the middle of the month, when the smoke got really heavy, and that smoke picture I showed you earlier, I started to water the vegetation, the fuel around my home. I like to have a lot of native plants around my home, and a lot of them are fire hazards, right? I lived downtown, but I was worried. And when Gatlinburg experienced its great fire, I said, wow, can that, can that happen everywhere? Is that a risk that's inherent in this landscape, or are there just certain places that are more vulnerable? What's the nature of this extreme, extreme event that caused this epic destruction? 
And it turns out that uh, there are a lot of, there's, there's something that we don't understand very well across the East, and it generally is fused under this term mountain wave. And it's not just restricted to the Southern Alps. It's been described in Virginia, and even if you do a Google search, you'll find discussion of in places like New Jersey. Uh, but the wind sets up a certain way. In the case here, what seems to happen quite often, the wind comes up in the, from the south in the, in the lee of a front that's going to move through. And there's a big valley here, and it's this. This is a very high range in the Great Smokies, 6,000 feet plus. Wind can't really easily move over it. It wants to go left. There's wind there moving north, too. It really can't go to the east. Blue Ridge Parkway's in the way. So it squeaks its way over the top. And so going south on the right to north on the left, wind pops over, and you get this really complex wind behavior down below hurricane speed winds recurrently. And what's amazing, this, this is a phenomenon. It happens even a couple times a year. You can find it in meteorological data. Uh, it had, in fact, it happened on March it happened on May 4th, the spring, just a few months after this prior mountain wave led to the Gatlinburg fire. It cost a million dollars in damage. People were reconstructing after the fire, and this great hurricane speed windstorm came and caused some additional damage. So it's, it's a phenomenon of this place, and that's something we need to know. Which places are vulnerable to these high, high winds? And so much of that fire event, logically speaking, may have just been a chance co-occurrence of an ignition ready to burn, right? At, take advantage of those high winds. And that may be why we thought it was so unlikely to happen. We never had that alignment of the stars before. This is what it looks like in May. This is an imposing storm. That has an impact on not just the homes, but on the vegetation on the whole system. And what's amazing, if you go here and look at the vegetation, you see patterns and structures. And if you think that, oh, they're similar to this, maybe the best predictor of where these large patches are, like here, Bullhead, Gatlinburg's up here. Some of these very large patches might be easily predictable just by you know, where the heath, the pine heath vegetation was in the past. This may not be exceptional. This might be a lot small fire. Henry might talk about that. It's like a small fire compared to what could happen here under one of these events, depending on where the fires might have started. This is the typical patch size. Here's a kilometer. Look at that. Upper slopes. This is the way it looks almost across the entire southern apse on all these dozens of large fires. Upper slopes tend to have modest departure. And at the same scale, one kilometer, this is the scale of the patch we have in Gatlinburg from those different wind conditions. It's massive. <coughs> South slope, north slope, very mild. The wind's in a little bit of an eddy there. It's uh, quite a bit <coughs> extraordinary. Uh, wrapping up here, this is uh, an aerial photo of Gatlinburg. Uh, when we talk about risk, it's not just the the hazard. It's not just the fuel or the environment you're in. It's also how you're putting things that are in the way. It's, it's your values and our landscape of values is changing quite a bit through here. Um, Gatlinburg, here's the park boundaries of the fires coming in from the south. And all these areas here, they're homes that have been developed over the last few decades. A little hard to see probably with the light, but this is a moisture index. So all the red are dry sites, and the blue are the riparian areas and the north slopes. <clears throat> you can see that the homes tend to be where there's a view. They tend to quite often be built in areas that are kind of flammable. These are the homes that were destroyed. <clears throat> Good guarantee that you had some problems if you were on these drier sites. But what's amazing, because of this extreme event, a lot of these riparian areas, these streams, look at this, they also lost a lot of homes. So it's not a perfect predictor by any means. You should go back to this. Uh, here's the year the home was built, a big surge in the last 50 years, in the last few decades.
zooming in on the fire severity of the vegetation, it's a little bit weak in areas where there's no vegetation. You can't really look at change when it's all urban. But again, all these south-facing slopes here, some of which are built, have uh, pretty high severity. Uh, looking at the ownership, who, is, who lost their home? You know, we can ask questions like that. It's in the public record. This is a big tourist area, just like a lot of the southern apps, but especially here. Uh, only a quarter of the people, of the people listed as owning those homes, lived in the county. Three quarters, three out of every four, <coughs> were living elsewhere in Tennessee, in Florida, Georgia, Alabama, South Carolina, Ohio, Kentucky, Mississippi, North Carolina, Indiana, and so on. I don't think anybody in Maine. That's challenging. <laughs> think about that. How are you going to go there and teach these people about fire safe landscaping? How are you going to uh, make sure they're not there in an emergency? This is a terrible challenge. And this is a trend. This is not just something that's a historical fact. This is a trend across the region. This is how our society is changing, how our landscape of values are changing. And that has a big impact for risk moving forward. So there's four components here. These are distributions of likelihood. You can have a low chance of bad fire weather, low or high. Well, we tend to be trending toward worse and worse fire weather. Climate change is real. Hot drought, heat particularly, makes that fire risk a big concern for us. In the southeast, we have a big problem with arson, more so than accidental ignitions. Mr. Burnett robs the South of its trees. That's an old poster from the 70s. It's still true based on 2016. That's something maybe we can get a handle on. That can change our risk. Uh, extreme development, we know where that's headed. More and more and more homes built in these places. And then uh, not burning, not doing prescribed fire, and the heat of these droughts, increasing late litter fall might also make a difference. So, there seems to be both trends here, as well as um, a perfect storm that happened a year and a half ago. So some concluding points, the fall fire season is different. I like to think of them as really different than the spring. We don't know much about the fall fire season. Most of our research has been on prescribed fire, wildfire in the spring. It's a big deal. We need to step up to the plate and understand fall differently, because it's a risk. We didn't appreciate. Most of these could have been invented. It's just a human fire regime. We have tools available to us. Uh, the movie is evolving. Our values are shifting. And that poses all sorts of management challenges related to fire, both in near real time as the fire is occurring, but also in the post-fire environment. And most importantly, I think that we need to better understand at a landscape scale how risks very. We've got places that can get these extreme events and other places that are less likely to. And we're making our, our choices about how we build and how we respond to fire and how we put our resources out there without knowing perhaps as much as we should. Thank you. We're going to have a chance to talk to the fan panel later, so if you have one better suited for that, go ahead. Early on in your presentation, you had a slide that showed fire occurring in the spring throughout the fall. Was a lot more arson in the fall versus the spring? I wonder if you could comment on that. <coughs> yes. Um, I can speak regionally yeah, for us. us. I mean, the fact is, most of our kids are. Getting out of baseball season, getting into football season, and or people are starting to get that fall excitement, getting ready to chill out for the winter. They just like setting fires. I mean, for fun. fun. For fun. For fun. For fun. They, they they're love bored. Yep. That's they're bored. That's what somebody said. Why did you set the fire? I was bored. Kid. Yeah. Uh, and there's a zillion different reasons, but they're just morons. Kids. <laughs>